every listed Chinese company on U.S. exchanges uh, that we can buy, uh, uh, it goes through that VIE structure. And it's through this structure, investors don't actually own a part of the underlying Chinese company. Um, and, you know, that might sound ridiculous, but it's true. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Zoom in China. I'm Simon Gao. How will U.S. capital markets react to the recent disastrous IPO of Didi, China's version of Uber? I had these discussions with former Under Secretary of State Keith Crock. Take a listen. Uh, let's talk about another big thing uh, happened the last week. So. Secretary Kroc, you have always championed U.S. investors and highlighted the risks associated with Chinese stocks and how they are the only stocks that are allowed not to follow U.S. accounting standards. So China's Uber, Didi, recently had a disastrous IPO in, in, in America because the central government of China basically killed Didi by ordering all Didi's 25 apps to be removed from the app store two days after the IPO. So what kind of impact would this have on the U.S. investment in the Chinese stocks? Could this have a long-term impact on the U.S. investment in China? By the way, the impact, I believe, is going to be big and it will be long-term. And, you know, what it shows is China's growing willingness to upend things with little notice, as exemplified by this DD. Uh, fiasco, pulling Ant's $34 billion IPO with two days to go. And then also with recent announcements by Chinese uh, financial regulators. Um, and, and I really think this should really be one of the biggest stories uh, in finance. And here's why. Um, here's the thing that a lot of people don't talk about. It's called a variable interest entity or VIE. And it goes like this. Almost every listed Chinese company on U.S. exchanges uh, that we can buy, uh, uh, it goes through that VIE structure. And it's through this structure, investors don't actually own a part of the underlying Chinese company. Um, and, you know, that might sound ridiculous, but it's true. So investors who buy shares in Chinese stocks such as Didi, Alibaba, Ten, Tencent, etc. Uh, they don't have any ownership of the underlying business whatsoever. And in reality, they're actually buying exposure to a Cayman Island registered shell company called a VIE. And that is many steps removed, technically, legally, and economically, from the real company in China. Okay, so this is mind-boggling. Do you mean that U.S. investors simply have no clue what they are buying, uh, you know, when they invest in Chinese stocks and when they buy, you know, Tencent, Alibaba stocks, that they own a percentage of the company as they doing, like U.S. and European stock market, but that's actually not the case. How can that be? Well, the reason behind it, Simone, is that under Chinese law, Foreign ownership in most Chinese industries is prohibited. And as a result, it's illegal for Chinese companies like Tencent and Alibaba to have any non-Chinese shareholders. And, and back in the early uh, 2000s, as the China growth engine was really beginning, uh, Chinese companies needed huge amounts of U.S. capital. And at the same time, Wall Street firms looked at the huge growth rates in China and wanted to be able to access that and take advantage of that. Uh, but Chinese law prevented them from doing both. And that's when it came up with this structure. Hmm. OK, how big is this problem? Can you put this uh, problem into perspective? Yeah. So right now, there are uh, currently 240 Chinese VIE companies listed on U.S. exchanges with a total market cap of more than $2 trillion. So think about that for a minute. Investors are ascribing a $2 trillion worth of value 
to a bunch of unenforceable contracts held in shell companies in the Cayman Islands. And where there's been a history of underlying company assets being stolen without warning, compensation, or recourse. And it it is honestly slightly staggering. I think that we've even gotten to this point, and the risk of that has increased with Didi and Alibaba. So can you give me an example? Have this happened before? As a matter of fact, yes, it has. So let's take uh, Ant Financial, uh, you know, uh, Ant, which grew up within Alibaba, used to be called Alipay, and it became China's largest payment processing company. It's the perfect example of risk of VIEs, and that is that what you think you own can be taken away from you at any time. So in 2011, Alibaba was literally stolen from U.S. investors uh, in Alibaba's VIE structure. And this is when founder and CEO Jack Ma unilaterally transferred 100% of the ownership of Alipay into a different company controlled solely by himself. Wow. (laughs) Then what happened? Well, one of their biggest investors was Yahoo. Uh, They were early investor early on in the Alibaba uh, VIE, and they amassed like a 43% stake. Uh, And when this happened, Yahoo didn't even find out about the transaction until months later. And they, of course, were absolutely outraged and launched into legal proceedings. However, due to the VAE structure, Yahoo, along with other shareholders, were powerless to do anything. Uh, They literally had no legal recourse because they legally, you know, the only thing they owned was 43% of the Cayman Island Shell Corporation that had illegal contracts with Alibaba unenforceable by Chinese law. So here's what happened. Jack Ma took a company worth billions of dollars directly from under the nose of thousands of U.S. investors in the VIE. And there was nothing that anyone could do about it. You know, uh, Yahoo Yahoo eventually got uh, a pitiful settlement uh, settlement from uh, from Ma on the VIE. Shareholders got about uh, $6 billion uh, out of what ended up to be a $300 billion asset. Um, And it goes without saying that the Yahoo shareholders were furious. And this, you know, this is, you know, this is something uh, that there's just no way to prevent. And and it could happen again very clearly. And and I think the risk has gone up uh, recently. Right, I mean, this is absolutely incredible. So, where does where did our financial system fail? How could things like that happen? Yeah, you know, uh, any American investor that sees a U.S. listed Chinese company, I think, just automatically assumes investing in it is like investing in any other company. Um, after all, you know, it's fair to assume it must have the stamp of approval from regulators, investment bankers, the stock exchanges, and the large well-known asset managers that already hold those shares. And each of these entities, uh, the way I look at it, have failed to do their job in protecting those American investors and educating them uh, on this substantial risk. And I think they let their commercial interests and conflict of interest get in the way of uh, protecting uh, U.S. investors. It's really a shame. There's something's really got to be done about it, especially now. Ray, tell me about your plan, how to fix this financial system in the future programs. So, Simone, as far as uh, my personal plans, you know, I'm going to continue uh, this mission, uh, especially in terms of educating U.S. investors. You know, at a, uh, one of the press conferences uh, that I held, I made a plea uh, to the press 
um, to educate uh, the average American investor, all American investors, on uh, the huge risk in terms of investing in Chinese companies. And, and I went over with them, uh, you know, the Chinese companies have broken, uh, uh, especially the Chinese military companies and surveillance companies into an unnatural amount of subsidiaries for the purpose of uh, disclosure and deception. Then what they do is they uh, bury those subs in uh, the MSCI index fund, the FTSE index fund, Bloomberg index fund, and then those go in uh, the big asset management funds like from BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street. Those are the big uh, three. For example, BlackRock has 431 uh, emerging fund products, either ETFs or mutual funds, uh, with chock full of Chinese companies. And then those go in the 11.7 trillion dollar pension funds. So, you know, one of the things that I'm really hoping for is that our Secretary of Labor, um, what he's able to do is to is to send out a business advisory um, to these pension funds because the secretary has two thirds of the authority uh, for this issue. Uh, he, he runs the Employee Benefits Security Administration, which is responsible uh, for uh, administering and enforcing the provisions of ERISA, which cover all pension funds. And ERISA provides protections for participants and in beneficiaries in these plans, uh, such as access to information. And the fund managers, the pension managers, have discretion in managing those plans and their plans' assets. And they've got to meet certain standards of conduct under the fiduciary responsibilities specified by law. You know, an example is the prudent man rule. And so the Secretary of Labor's job is to educate him. So I'm hoping that uh, he issues a business advisory, just like we did, uh, where we issued it to all companies uh, regarding the uh, utilizing forced labor uh, from Xinjiang in their supply chains. That would go a long way. Uh, Secretary of Labor is also responsible for the Pension Bene Benefit Guarantee Corporation. So this is the insurance company that holds funds that back up pension funds in case they go defunct or bankrupt. And they're holding a significant amount of Chinese uh, companies. Uh, and a lot of those are listed on the Chinese exchanges from the MSCI index fund. And just like uh, the TSP, which is the federal, uh, federal employees pension funds divested of the MSCI index funds, I'm hoping the benefit, uh, pension benefit guarantee program will as well. So uh, stay tuned on that one. And I really believe uh, transparency on this issue is the best disinfectant. You know, as, as a former CEO of public companies uh, and a chairman uh, of Purdue, I wrote a letter uh, uh, about this issue. I wrote three letters. One was to all uh, the CEOs of U.S. companies on this issue. The other was to all the board of uh, governors of universities and their foundations, because those are also chock full of the MSCI, MSCI index fund and consequently Chinese index funds. What was interesting to learn is most of these guys in the, who are you know on the board of governors of these foundations, they have no idea. Um, I also wrote a letter to the civil society leaders, those organizations, particularly uh, ESG, um, because that is a, like a standards body for uh, clean investing. So environment, social governance, and in social, that's what covers human rights and genocide. Um, and so to be financing companies, for example, that use slave labor uh, or enabling genocide, uh, I'm really waiting for that community to call them out. And that's key. Uh, to educate him. You know, the last thing is that we just announced uh, uh, the Purdue uh, Tech Tag. It's the Center for Technology Diplomacy at Purdue, my old alma mater, where I was chairman of the Board of Trustees, uh, and I'm the chairman of that. So I'm really looking forward uh, to working a lot in, in those areas. And one of those issues there is uh, clean technology and advancing that. 
And, um, and solar energy is going to be, uh, industry experts predict, it's going to be 50 to 70% of the world's energy by 2050. We all want to take action on climate change. Um, you know, but if we do nothing, uh, we'll be getting our solar energy, not only from China, but the vast majority is in Xinjiang, where they have the big open pit coal mines. And um, because it's a, a very energy intensive manufacturing uh, process, so that you have the world's two biggest coal fired plants there making solar panels. It also util uh, utilizes slave labor. It's also national security issue because energy security is national security. We don't want to depend on the Chinese uh, for our energy. Yeah. And also just what actually happens to those uh, Chinese stocks like Didi. After Didi, do you think the appetite for U.S. investment in Chinese market could shrink? Yes, Simone, I do think uh, this is big. And I do think the market for Chinese companies is, is going to shrink. You know, it was interesting with the... Uh, with the Ali, uh, with Ant Financial, uh, where the IPO got pulled, uh, you know, with uh, two days before it was set to go, the bankers got hurt. But with DD, this is a whole new thing. Um, you know, the Chinese Communist Party knowingly let it go public at a high valuation so they could extract the U.S. investors' money, and then a couple of days later, they tanked the thing. Um, and this hurt the investors. You know, I think one of the questions that needs to be asked is that, did the regulators in China know about this? I have to think yes. And did they disclose this? And then mostly the investment bankers, why did they do a big job of disclosing it? Or as a matter of fact, pulling it? Um, you know, I've taken three companies public and that's a really tight community. And when you've got something uh, that is glaring you right in the face. That's as big as this. You pull the you pull the IPO. That's their fiduciary duty. So I think that's uh, that's going to be out there and questioned. You know, the other big thing is to eliminate these VIEs. Um, this is something nobody talks about. And now with uh, she at his discretion and the regulars at their discretion not afraid to do to to not only hurt their own companies but u.s shareholders on a whim they have all the leverage with the vies because anybody who's made an investment in chinese stocks on american exchanges actually doesn't have the ownership and has no legal recourse uh economically or legally so i think that's going to come into play um i think one of the other things that's big is you know the Chinese don't follow. Uh, they're, they're the only companies, the Chinese companies are the only companies that don't follow uh, universal and gap accounting standards. And, uh, and, and we gave them three years to fix it. I think it's way too long, as you can see, and what just happened to Didi. And, um, uh, you know, this could be changed within a 30 day notice because, and 2013, an MOU got signed uh, between uh, the uh, China regulators and the PCAOB, which is uh, the accountings board that uh, has responsibility for this. So I think there's some pressure on the chairman of the PCAOB to give that 30 day notice and say, you guys got to get your accounting straight right now. I'm, I'm also sure uh, Secretary of the Treasury Yellen uh, uh, has the authority to do that as well. Right, right. I mean, maybe in the short term, they hate, uh, they hurt the U.S. investors, but in the long run, this would definitely prevent them from investing in China anymore, I think. But anyway, uh, thank you so much, uh, Secretary Kroc. Do you have anything else to add? Well, I guess one last thing, uh, Simone. You know, the free world... Uh, it's not only looked the other way from uh, the communist China crimes for way too long, but we finance them by providing them access to our capital markets. Uh, and we not only sent over a treasure trove of our best investment bankers, lawyers, money managers, private equity investors, and venture capitalists, but we funded China Inc. for our pension funds, 
university endowments, foundations, mutual funds, bond portfolios. Um, and most of these Chinese companies are tied uh, to the CCP, practically all of them. And especially with uh, military civil fusion uh, and with their national intelligence law. Uh, I could tell you as a former CEO of public companies and the chairman of the board of Purdue, uh, these boards uh, and various institutions have a moral obligation and a fiduciary duty to disclose Chinese holdings and divest from companies enabling human rights violations. Um, as Under Secretary uh, of State, uh, I directed this communication with three uh, separate letters. Um, and I think that was really important. One to the CEOs of American companies, the other the university governing boards, and the third to civil society organizations. And so at a minimum, they should disclose uh, the Chinese stocks they're invested in. And I think the DD debacle is the latest sign that investing in China stocks is not worth the risk. Uh, many investors who are hot about DD got burned, uh, just like they got burned with luck and coffee, but even in a bigger way. Simone, my hat's off to President Biden for institutionalizing capital market sanctions and really picking up in a lot of the areas where we left off. Um, uh, it's just so important because we've been funding this Chinese military machine, as well as their surveillance state that has enabled genocide. Um, I think it, three important companies, I would add to that uh, OFAC list, that capital market sanction list, and that would be the big three, Alibaba, Tencent, and Baidu, because these three companies are the most strategic companies to the Chinese military's AI, uh, programs. They're also the backbone of the surveillance state along with Huawei. And I think we've got to, we've got to do something there um, with those. Uh, and finally, I think it's really important that we have continuity of policy so that companies that are on the commerce entity list, that means we cannot export technology to them, that those go on the capital market sanctions list. It just doesn't make sense. And we did a comparison of those two lists, uh, you know, just a few months ago, back in January. And of the 500 Chinese companies that are on the entity list that we couldn't export to, only seven of those are on the OFAC list. So I think we need continuity of policy there. And particularly uh, these companies that just got put on the commerce entity list that are enabling the genocide and human rights abuses in Xinjiang. And my hat's off to President Biden for putting them on the list uh, as well. They should go on that OFAC list. Right. Those two lists are from from uh, the State Department and the Commerce Department should definitely be synchronized. I mean, this is a problem that people have been talking about for a long time. Hopefully it will be solved soon. Thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Secretary, and thank you for joining Zoom in today. All right, Simone. Thanks very much. That's it for today. Please like, share, and subscribe to my channel if you like our production. Also, most importantly, please subscribe to my membership website, zoomingin.tv. Members get video audio formats of my show, transcript, and member-only in-depth report. I will also do live Q&A with members on the website. $5 a month, cancel anytime. So please check it out. Thanks for watching. I'm Simon Gao, and I'll see you next time.